Uh, good afternoon. Thank you all for letting me come. I um, have a great deal of respect for what uh, the folks in this room are doing across the state and am always amazed at what you accomplish and your dedication and your passion and know that a lot of times you don't get the recognition that you deserve uh, and that it can sometimes I think probably feel isolating and feel a bit like hitting your head up against a brick wall um, but I want to acknowledge that there are folks out there that know what you do and we do appreciate it because you're the ones that are on the front lines you're the ones that are impacting countless students lives and not just the students at your institutions um, you're impacting students at other institutions and you're impacting future students and so thank you for doing what you do and thank you for letting me spend a little bit of time here at the end with you to raise some questions so there's a couple of things you should know about me that Sune didn't say and then there's a lot of things you should know about me that I'm not and I'm gonna start with the what I'm not um, the folks that know me in the room know that I am a horrible bureaucrat and not well suited for that world uh, I also don't have all the answers what I am though is I can be a bit of a provocateur I like to ask questions I like to see what happens when folks start talking and I'm not afraid of the big questions now whether that's from courage or stupidity I'm not sure um, I'm also pretty much the most unlikely poster child you would ever find for these ideas of a ten thousand dollar bachelor's degree applied baccalaureate programs I came out of very traditional undergraduate and graduate programs I'm a historian we're not always the most forward-thinking our discipline has us looking past it also has us largely dealing with dead people so sometimes we don't have the best <laughs> interpersonal skills either or communication skills but um, how I ended up here is really something that still boggles me um, but I think there are some really unbelievable things that are happening in higher education and I think that we're at a crossroads moment that we've never been at before and I think that it's a moment that the optimistic piece of me believes is ripe with possibilities now there's also a very pessimistic piece of me that thinks that it's all just a bunch of crap and organizations never change and who are we kidding higher ed has been around for centuries and let's face it we're still basically wearing medieval monks robes during graduation ceremonies and carrying a mace around which was a medieval weapon so uh, I don't know here but I want to I want to try to create a space that we can maybe at least dream that change might happen and because I'm a historian and because I'm a recovering professor I was a, a, a professor for 10 years and I haven't been in front of a classroom in the last six years so that's always dangerous when I get to have this opportunity I want to start with a story because I think that everything that we're about and everything that you've been looking at these last few days ultimately is about storytelling it's ultimately about the stories that we tell to our students and it's also about the stories that we tell to the rest of the world about what we do and about our students and about the possibilities so I want to start with a story it's a historical story it's the story of the Trojan horse thus beware of geeks bringing gifts I'd like to posit that what we have is a really unusual opportunity now sometimes you just have to put some of the technology down and do it the old-fashioned way or not have anything work that happens too sometimes there we go 
is the story of the Trojan horse. If you remember any of your classical literature, the uh, Battle of Troy lasted a little over a decade um, in classical literature. Got started over an apple and a woman. Um, Paris, had the, uh, Paris, who was supposedly the most beautiful man in the world, had the unenviable task of trying to decide who was the most beautiful of three of the most powerful Greek goddesses. And ultimately, he said Aphrodite was because she made him the best offer. She got the best bribe on the table. If he said that she was the most beautiful and could have the golden apple, then she would let him marry the most beautiful woman in the world, which was Helen. Little problem, Helen was married happily. Not going to make any difference though to, uh, to Paris. He went off with his Greek army. Well, Paris went off. He found, found Helen. He kidnapped her. He married her. And they hold themselves up behind the walls of Troy, this extraordinarily robust, well-protected city. And needless to say, Helen's husband was not real happy about this development. And so he convinced all of her old suitors to come together and help him recapture the love of his life. And so the Greeks sailed off, they finally found Troy, and they started a siege. And for 10 years, they tried to get in the gates to no avail. Until finally, they thought, okay, Clearly, a frontal assault is not working. Let's think creatively. And so the story goes that they built a 300-foot wooden horse that was hollow inside, that was going to hide a small group of Greek soldiers. They would leave it behind with Simon, the poor schmuck that had to stay behind and, and face the Trojans, so that he could convince them that this was really this wonderful gift, and if they brought it into their city, they would have all sorts of luck. And most folks thought that was a good idea. There were a couple that didn't. One of the names may be familiar, Cassandra. You know, now we say somebody's a Cassandra. If they're uh, doubting everything, well, she, it turns out she was right to be doubtful about the Trojan horse. And uh, Laocoon, who was one of the priests, raised some concerns too. In fact, he looked at his king and his prince, and this is the only time in my life that I've ever gotten to show off the little bit of the one semester of Latin that I barely passed. He said, Timio Deneos et Dona Ferentis, I fear the Greeks, even those bearing gifts. And lo and behold, good reason. They drag the horse into the city, night falls, the soldiers come out, they open the gates, the Greek army invades, and they decimate Troy. Great story. Sometimes, though, images do a better job of telling a story, so... As you're moving to your main course, I want to treat you to a few minutes of a little bit of a more exciting retelling of the Trojan horse. I promise I'm not going to show you the game that's anticipated to be rated mature. I think we should burn it. Burn it, my friend. 
Gotta love the score. So why this story? Well, I would like to posit that we should think of ourselves as those Greeks, and that higher education is the walled city of Troy. It stood there forever. It's a little arrogant and pompous around the edges sometimes. But we know it can be better. We just have to figure out how to breach it. And sometimes frontal assaults don't work. So I'd like us to think about the ways in which we can use technology, we can use all of these discussions of disruption and innovation and MOOCs and competency-based and whatever the term du jour is of the day that everyone is fixating on, as our Trojan horse to begin to get into the city and create change from within. So, What's our city look like right now? Well, we've got some problems with our walled city of higher ed. And they're all problems that everyone in this room knows about, but I think it's worth putting a name to them and calling them out. We have problems of affordability. This is a adjusted, it's both public and uh, private college and university tuition, two and four year tuition adjusted for uh, U.S. inflation. So the red here would be the baseline. We see in 1978 everything's starting okay. Blue line, dark blue is tuition and fees. The uh, sort of lighter blue line right underneath that is educational books and supplies. There's, for comparison's sake we've got housing prices which is the gray line. The other blue line is consumer prices and then the sort of teal aqua marine, I think, um, line would be average hourly wage. We hear people saying all the time that we have a problem with the cost of higher ed. But I don't think that we truly comprehend that necessarily until we look at something like this where we see almost a 1200% increase in costs once you adjust for inflation from 1978. Put a little bit of another spin on it. In 2012-2013, so for the current academic year, the average tuition and fees per year at a public four-year university was a little bit over 8600 If we adjust for 2012-2013 dollars, that is a 250 percent increase over what we had in 1982. And again, we know that when we look at something like this, we're not seeing wages keep track. Why is it so expensive? Well, one of the problems that we have is that we see a world where we have a decreasing amount of state and federal aid that can go to public, especially public higher education. And higher ed has had to figure out where do they make that up. And increasingly where it's been made up, especially in Texas after the deregulation of tuition, has been in tuition and fees. And a lot of times, especially as we all know, those fees. Because it's one political thing to say that you're raising tuition. It's not as bad politically sometimes to sort of push it on that fee side and then just not talk about the fees, although increasingly that's not working out too good either. So we have this horrible problem with cost that's impacting affordability. So if it's being pushed down to the students, what does that mean for the students? Well, one of the things means that we see this growth of student loans. 
And it's the red one there that I want you to pay attention to. That's the cumulative student loan growth. Just since 9901. We start at zero, and then once we hit the first quarter of 2004, we see this unbelievably steep, steep curve. So that we're now seeing a growth of over 500% in cumulative student loan growth. It's over a trillion dollars now. Another way of thinking about that is that in 1990, the amount there in green was represented student growth. In 2000, it had a little bit more than doubled, but look what happened between 2000 and 2011. So what are we gonna do? Because we know this is having some horrible impacts in terms of what happens with our students. We look at the share of family income that's needed to pay for a degree from a four-year public institution. It's 16.9% nationally, almost 16% in Texas. We're doing a little bit better job here. It's not any better, really, at community colleges. 12.9% nationally and 11.3% in the state. We have huge costs for non-completion because what's the result of this? Well, the result is that we've got more and more students who are having to stop out. They start, they're qualified to get a degree, they want to get a degree, but eventually the costs catch up with many of them and they have to stop out. And that has its own impact in terms not just of their lives, but it has a tremendous economic impact for us. 56% of all of those students who stop out, and in Texas we have over 3.6 million adults with some college education and no credential. 56% of those non-completers from Texas public universities are leaving with student debt. They don't have the credential to get the job to help them pay it back, but they sure do have the ticket. They've got the debt that they have to repay. And the average one for a non-completer, mind you, at a Texas public university is almost $12,000. So they're leaving without a credential. It's going to impact their ability to get a job. And they've got $12,000 that they have to pay out of pocket. Community colleges, 22% leave with student debt, with 6,800 as the average debt. That has some pretty severe impacts. And if the debt piece wasn't enough, we also have problems that the people that are supposed to be employing these students are saying that they're not convinced that it's worth it, that the degrees for the ones that finish have value. They don't think that we're doing a good job to prepare our students for the challenges of a global economy. How many folks are faculty members in the room? Raise your hands. So here's my question for you. If a student scored a 25 on an exam, what grade would they get? At least one group of folks thinks that we're failing. Now, you know, and I know, that we're not failing, that there are tremendous success stories, that what we do absolutely changes the lives of students and their families for generations to come. We know that when students finish a credential, whether it be an associate's degree or a baccalaureate degree, those folks are more likely to have a job, they're less likely to be unemployed, they're more likely to have insurance, and they're less likely to need any sort of public financial aid. Shoot, they're more likely to wear their seat belts. They're more likely to vote. 
Their children are more likely to go to college. There's the really important one. Reading comprehension rates of their children tend to be higher as early as elementary school. We know we're changing lives. So where's the disconnect? Well, if this wasn't sobering enough, let's look at what all that loan is doing for the students who finish. So these are the students who finish a degree and had to borrow. This was a study done in 2011 by the Pew Research Center, and I would really strongly recommend that everyone take a look at it because it is a sobering and frightening read. 48% reported that it's harder to pay their bills because of their debt. 25% said it was harder to buy a home because of their debt. 24% said it impacted their career choice. All those teachers we need, all those nurses we need, all those public employees that we need where those salaries just aren't that great even though they're central to our survival and quality of life as a society. If you're graduating with a lot of debt, it's hard to justify taking one of those salaries. And if this wasn't bad enough, here's the one that finally made me go, oh my God. 7% are saying that this is preventing them from marriage and starting a family. We have a generation that is postponing their lives and that their debt to get a degree is becoming one of the central factors that determines the course of their life. And that's going to catch up with us economically. It's going to catch up with us as a society. Let's talk about the economics. Total lifetime income lost by Texas University students. These are the ones that don't complete a four-year degree. So let's assume that they don't drop out because of student debt. Let's assume they even stop and have no debt to pay back. How does it affect them? Over $13 billion. And that's just Texas. So one of the realities of our walled city is that there are an awful lot of people that aren't getting by. Not only do they not have the tools and the credentials to get by, but they're trying to climb out of a hole without the tools. Well, What's another one of the realities of our walled city? Yeah, you're stuck with me, I'm a historian. And more to the point, I'm an American historian. Um, which means I sometimes actually think about things like the Industrial Revolution and scientific management. So here's, I think, another reality of our walled city. We're still using a 19th century teaching model and a 19th century philosophical model in the 21st century. Now, not everyone is doing this, but a lot are. So Taylorism, Frederick Taylor, 19th century economist, he's the guy that um, started the whole efficiency movement. He studied folks in, on assembly lines and literally clocked the number of steps they took and how long it took them to do something so that they could figure out how to get maximum efficiency. He's the guy that is largely responsible for things like this, him and Henry Ford. Industrialization, efficiency, uniformity. and very little individualism, if any. This is what it looks like in the 19th century on a factory floor. This is what it's looked like in our classrooms in the past. 
You notice the physical similarities? Everyone's still in little rows. They're all dressed alike. We'd like to think we've moved away from this. I mean, this isn't what your classes look like, is it? No. Well, I would posit, though, that we have something that's replaced this that's still pretty much this. This is what I think industrialization, Taylorism, scientific management in higher ed looks like in 2013. It's still the sage on the stage model. It's just sage on the stage 2.0. You still got somebody up at the front. We like to think it's more interactive because look, they've got their laptops. They're engaged. I don't know if you can see it from there. So I've got some handy little red circles here. If you start looking at what's on the laptops, so that guy, that person's checking their email. Looks like that one is. That one is. Actually, that one I think is surfing the web. We got another one that's either surfing the web or doing email. Got another one. Another one. And those are just the ones that I could see with my bifocals on. <laughs> They're not engaged. It's still the idea that there's somebody up front. It's still what Paulo Freire and the pedagogy of the oppressed called the banker model of education. Teachers are going to make a learning deposit in their students and then they'll make a withdrawal at test time. And I dare say that every single one of us in this room has experienced a classroom like that as a student. And I'd be willing to bet every single one of us fell asleep at best. And that there's probably a good number of folks in this room that failed the class because you were bored, because it had no meaning to you, because it really didn't matter if you were there or not. It was all about the person at the front. Ironically, so that I'm not the kettle calling the pot black, kind of like right now. I, well, you, you at least aren't throwing things. And I, I specifically told Sune when he asked if I would do this that that would be great. I was more than happy to. I just requested no hard rolls be served at lunch. <laughs> Does anyone in here think this is learning? No. We know it's not. But we also know that we've got a lot of colleagues that think it is. And they're probably especially proud because they're using a PowerPoint. And their students have their laptops open, so they're engaged. Yeah. This is another one of those little dirty secrets about our walled city. This is what our ghettos look like. So what do we do? I mean, all of you in here are trying to fight this. Many of you don't do it, but you all know colleagues that do. For those of you that are not teaching, but you're the instructional designers, Lord knows you've had these battles. And the fact that you still have hair on your heads uh, and are able to stand up uh, is an attest to your endurance and courage and commitment. So how do we change our walled city? Where are our Trojan horses? I got a couple of them that I think are Trojan horses. But they're not necessarily great Trojan horses. We still have to be concerned. The first one, and I shudder to say it, because it is at best overhyped. Drum roll. <laughs> MOOCs. It's, it's, I mean, let's, let's face it, for starters, it's hard to take anything seriously that sounds like MOOCs. <laughs> it sounds like we're a bunch of barnyard animals sometimes. But boy, we know that there are a lot of folks, especially a lot of administrators, that think this is great. This is going to save us. This is going to reduce cost. 
hey, it's technology, so it's got to be good. It's the answer. I would argue it's probably not the answer. But that it does give us a way into the gate. The folks on campuses, the administrators on campuses, that are trumpeting this the most, oftentimes are trumpeting it because I think their hearts are in the right place. They want to figure out a way to address affordability. They want to figure out a way to make education more accessible. And so let's work with that motivation. Because I also don't think, at least for me, it's a motivation I share. It's common ground. We can use it as our Trojan horse to get us in the gates. But I'm not sure that that's what we're doing. Let's talk about what's problematic with MOOCs, for starters. Um, again, I have no idea how this comes about as somebody who's trained in such, was trained in such traditional departments and programs. But I've spent a fair amount of time, at least for a historian, reading uh, Pablo, Freire, Pablo Freire's um, thoughts. And if any of you are familiar with him, he was a Marxist Latin American radical who taught people how to read. In fact, more to the point, he taught the, he taught the people that lived in the most impoverished areas and had no access to anything how to read. And he did it because he believed that that was transformative. But it wasn't just learning how to read that Freire thought was transformative. It was the process of engaging somebody who was oppressed, who had not ever had the opportunity to be engaged, and give them space to discover their voices. Freire actually argued that the power in the classroom shouldn't be from that sage on the stage to the students, but that the power should be reversed. It should be from the students to the facilitator. He wouldn't even call them educators, the facilitators. And that that would be transformative. Because it wouldn't just be a skill that somebody learned, it wouldn't just be knowledge but they would learn and discover their place and their agency. MOOCs are kind of short, at least in their iteration right now, on that power thing. It's gone from a sage on the stage to a dock on the laptop. <laughs> Kathy Davidson's term. I wish I could, I could take credit for it, but I won't. It's still all about somebody, the expert, putting information out there. Now, in the best circumstances, there's really great opportunities for back chatter. And because there's a global network, it's an amazing opportunity to bring people together for conversation and to have access to learning that they never would have had otherwise. That's the wonderful theory behind it. And sometimes we see that it happens. You know, I'm, I'm thinking about, I think one of uh, Sebastian Thrun's courses where you know, there were people in India and Africa and Lebanon and Syria and Britain and the United States and they were all engaged in this conversation and, when, and, and they were willing to go to the next level. So that when one of their peers lost their internet access, during all of the issues in Libya, they found a workaround for her so that she could be a part of the course and continue to have the conversations. So there are some wonderful opportunities, but they're still kind of the exception. Access is great, but what if it's not the right access? And so we have this tension between folks that are saying this is the greatest thing since sliced bread and faculty that are saying, oh, hell no. <laughs> You're going to replace me with a talking head? And then somehow we're supposed to find a way to mediate. Because I think this is what 
the responses that we're most used to. San Jose State, I mean, this is literally just a couple of months ago. Um, San Jose State's president urged their philosophy department to avail themselves of one of the MOOC courses on justice. And this was their letter to the, I believe it was the Harvard professor who uh, taught the course. They, 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 they said, we see this as an, as an attempt to replace professors, dismantle departments, and provide a diminished education for students in public universities. Two classes of universities will be created, one well-funded college, an university in which privileged students get their own real professors, the other financially stressed public-private universities in which students watch a bunch of videotaped lecturers and interact, if indeed any interaction is available on their home campuses, with the professor that his model of education has turned into a glorified teaching assistant. God, I love the fact that philosophers don't mince words sometimes. <laughs> How many of you have heard faculty, either publicly or privately, say this to you? So, it's a legitimate critique. And we can do one of three things. We can ignore it and let education march on. Let them bring in the MOOCs. It's kind of like bring in the clowns, I don't know. <laughs> we can look at the faculty and say, you're right, we shouldn't even engage in this discussion. Go find your pitchforks and your flaming torches. Or we can do something that I think is a whole lot harder but is also, I think, holds a lot more potential. And that's recognize that this is fear, in part, a fear that people are going to lose their jobs. And in the humanities, it's a really very real and present danger. But then say, we recognize it's a fear, but is there something here that can help our students? Whether it's access, whether it's providing alternative ways of learning, is there something here? If you don't like the way it is, then let's try to figure out how to change it. But those conversations are, A, very hard to have, B, they're very uncomfortable and you run the risk of being the person that they turn the pitchforks on. From both sides, quite frankly. And they're risky. But I think it's a Trojan horse for us. I think it's a way to engage in conversations about what should learning technology look like with good pedagogy. How can we use these things to improve access? How can we think outside the box? I mean, and what are the roles? Of, here's the really frightening one. But I think also the one that is really ultimately exciting and the key to a lot of this, what are the roles of faculty? When I was a, I, so I taught for a little over 10 years. I taught an awful lot of intro level mandatory US 1 and US 2 history courses. So you can imagine how popular those were. <laughs> and when I started teaching, I thought I was going to bring knowledge to my masses of students. <coughs> yeah. Um, very quickly, A, they disabused me of that notion. But also, in just the decade I taught, we went from a time where, yeah, the internet, you could pull some things off of it, but it was still kind of new, to a time where, and my phone, I think, is somewhere over there, but a time now where almost every single one of us and most of our students can pull out a smartphone or an iPad or a tablet, and they can call up more information than we know. Faculty's roles are changing. The university's role is changing. We were once the creators of knowledge. And we were once had a monopoly on its distribution. 
and now we don't. If we're not careful, I think we're going to go the way that print media has gone. We have to rethink what it is that we do. And if we don't have to be the sole providers of information anymore, what does that free us up to do? What can we spend more time doing? Well, most of y'all are doing it. I mean, it, it's now sexy again, so we call it flipped classrooms. But, you know, it's been around for a while. But it's a different model than somebody up at the front, you know, talking, even if they all have their laptops open and it looks like from the front they're engaged. It's a different model of dumping information into people's heads to let's explore and talk. So I think that there's something here that we can use as one of our Trojan horses. But we have to be willing to engage with this and move past it. The other Trojan horse I want to talk about really briefly is competency-based education. And I have a bias here, as Sune mentioned. I manage um, our state's EDUCAUSE grant. Um, one of the Next Generation Learning Challenges grants, million dollars that we are working with Texas A&M Commerce and South Texas College to create a competency-based degree. So competency-based has been in the news a lot with the Department of Ed and everyone else. Have difficulty determining what that means, so here's our working definition. Knowledge, skills, and attitudes make competencies. Again, this ain't rocket science and it's not new. It's been around for a while. but. There's some interesting things that are happening now with it. So our program, Texas Affordable Baccalaureate Project, is a Bachelor of Applied Sciences in Organizational Leadership with A&M Commerce South Texas College. The first 90 lower division semester credit hours are completely online and they're completely self-paced, non-faculty led. And the general education half of it is completely competency based. Now it doesn't mean that there isn't individualized instruction going on, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. It's a way to try to move beyond time in the seat to knowledge that's been mastered. Go through this quickly. So we've got four sort of things that we're trying to deal with here. We're trying to deal with cost, we're trying to deal with competency education, we're trying to deal with changing staffing models, and then leveraging technology to do all of this. So our alternative staffing model is a disaggregation of faculty roles. We have content experts that are developing the competencies in the curriculum. Those are our faculty and they're all full-time faculty from STC and Commerce. We'll have full-time academic coaches who will be professional, salaried, and benefited staff with at least a master's degree because let's call this the way that we need to call it. A lot of times we're using adjuncts to try to decrease the cost. And I'll call it the way that I call it. And, I, and, this, and this is me, this isn't necessarily me representing, in fact this isn't, I'm not representing the coordinating board at this point. It's unethical to use adjuncts and it's exploitative. We have a lot of folks who have PhDs and a hell of a lot of debt who are trying to cobble together a barely living wage by teaching six, seven, eight courses. They're not able to teach the way they want to and they're not able to give their students the attention that they need. And we're having them do it in the gateway introductory level courses where folks are most likely to fail and if they fail they're most likely to drop out. So not only are we not really making a big difference in the cost to students, but we're also setting them up to leave with a lot of debt and no credential. And we're just acting unethically. So what we're positing is let's walk away from that model. But let's look at what it is that a faculty member does. Yes, they create knowledge and research. Yes, they teach. And, but we also expect them to coach. We expect them to mentor. We expect them to advise other things that we never give them any training for. What happens if we tear those roles apart? What happens if we have full-time professional staff that act as coaches and mentors? 
What happens if we have full-time professional staff that basically act as content experts that provide individualized instruction? And then what happens if we use our full-time faculty to develop the framework and the curriculum for all of this? Can we end up with something that A, is more affordable, and B, is better for the students? And we think we can. So we're looking at a disaggregated teaching model. Student comes into the program, they'll be assigned an academic coach who'll stay with them through the life of their time in the program. That person will have a lot of learning analytics to help them provide assistance to students where they need it. So that means we have to harness big data, which is another one of those nice, big, sexy terms right now. Uh, we'll use uh, Texas Success Initiative data. We'll use um, something like the uh, CAP. We use real-time assessments, competency assessments, learner engagement data. Basically, we're going to collect as much information as we can about these people. And the reason why we're going to do that is not because we just want to, because ultimately we want to be able to deal predictive analytics. Because that's one of those ways now where we have the technology and the ability to make interventions, not just just in time, but before they're needed. If any of you are familiar, um, or not familiar, I, I, I suggest that you um, learn about the work that Tristan Delaney, who is the provost at Austin Peay State University in, in Tennessee, has done, and what that institution has done. They built basically an algorithm, and, and it helped that their provost was a mathematician. But they built a predictive algorithm where they looked at the success or non-success of students in key courses, and they looked at all the characteristics of those students so that they could then begin to track what were the characteristics of students who were successful, what were the characteristics of students who weren't. And then they gave that to their advisors, and more importantly, they gave it to the students. I mean, they basically developed what they've called a Netflix for advising. So that a student can know, okay, if I want to take this class or need to take this class, but I don't have these sets of characteristics, I may need to pay more attention here. And the advisor can have that conversation with them and say, okay, great, you want to do this? All right, let's talk about it. If you're dead set that you're going to do it, what supports do we need to give you before you even walk into the classroom so that you'll be successful? And that takes advising to a whole nother level that we've never been able to do before and finally have the software and the capabilities to begin to do it. But it means we have to think differently about data as well. It also means we have to get our faculty to think about data. And again, I'll, I'll point to myself. I chose a graduate program partly where I didn't have to take statistics. I don't know what to do with data. And I came out of the humanities. That was a bad word for us. I mean, that literally, it was a four-letter word. <laughs> but how can we use it to shape the interactions with our students and help them be more successful? And again, I think this is another Trojan horse for us because all of our administrators, all of, certainly all of our institutional research folks, the state and the feds all want to talk about data so let's talk about data, but let's see what we can do with it, and let's help faculty have those conversations to see what they can do with it. So the other thing that we know that we have to do is we have to be interactive. We don't want this to be doc on a laptop. We want to create virtual communities so that you actually have people learning and leveraging the technology to learn together. We're looking at academic social networking. We're looking at entry cohorts, cohorts and competency cluster cohorts. We're looking at upper division cohorts. That's a hard word to say for some reason today. <laughs> cohorts. We're looking at team-based learning. How do we use the technology to connect people and allow them to interact with each other? Rather than, all right, log into Blackboard and do a posting on this discussion board and then respond to a couple. Okay, you're done. That's not interaction. We know it's not. So these are some of the Trojan horses. Very quickly, I want to put out some questions about what do we do once we get in the city? Because I'm going to assume we don't want to kill everyone like the Greeks did. 
I'm assuming we're no longer in, we, we, we're uninterested in the rape and the pillage. So what do we do once we get in? Well, how many of you are familiar with the, uh, the concept of hype cycles? Is this familiar to anyone? All right. This is a neat thing and probably a little overhyped too. So Gartner Research does uh, reports every year on hype cycles. A hype cycle, and, and they do it mostly on technology. Uh, this is their education hype cycle for 2012. What they argue is that you have a technology trigger and then you've got this peak of inflated expectations as everyone thinks, oh wow, this is great. And then ultimately reality sets in and you hit the trough of disillusionment. Oh man, we wasted our money on that. Who was the idiot that approved spending all that money on X? <laughs> or from the faculty's perspective, we told you it wasn't going to work. But then they argue that we then begin to enter into the slope of enlightenment. All right, maybe there was something there after all. Let's just readjust our expectations. And that finally you end up someplace, not quite up at that peak of inflated expectations, but you end up at a middle ground. They call it the plateau of productivity. All right, we realistically know what to expect here and we can make it work. So I would say that one of the things that we need to do when we get in the gates is we need to be critical. We're uniquely trained to be critical thinkers. And especially those of you who are faculty and, and those of you who are learning technologists, you have a foot in both worlds. You can talk geek. You can talk pedagogy. That helps with the faculty that talk pedagogy. You can talk geek. That helps with the administrators. But you're positioned to be able to say, okay, wait a minute, Let, let's just, everyone put your guns down. Okay, maybe it's not the greatest thing in the world, but it's probably not the worst thing in the world. Where's our middle ground? You also, I think we have an opportunity because if we know that this is happening, we can then sort of look at the new toys a little bit differently. So this is the 2012 cycle. There's a few things on here and I know you can't read it from there. So I've highlighted them that I think are uh, interesting. So the first is big data is not even up yet at the peak of inflated expectations. So this is 2012. It's probably a little bit up higher still, but I still don't think it's at its peak. So in 2012 MOOCs, which weren't even on this in 2011, July 2012, they hadn't hit their peak yet. I, I would argue that when we look at all of the discussion that's going on almost daily in the Chronicle of Higher Ed and inside Higher Ed, that we're probably now entering into the trough of disillusionment with MOOCs. <laughs> um, and eventually we'll probably pull out, but we, I think we probably still have a ways left to fall. Applied learning, this idea that uh, we can mine big data, that we can have um, software that allows a student to, you know, or adaptive learning rather, that allows a student to, to see where they mess up and the software analyzes it and then helps them. So Gardner thinks that, that they're at the, the peak of expectations and we're going to start seeing them fade off. I think there may be something there. Um, how many of you are familiar with the MLA, the Modern Language Association? So, you know, the MLA did a report just a couple of weeks ago, uh, a scathing report on the horribleness that is automated essay assessment. So, I think we're probably starting to enter into the trough of disillusionment there. Um, but then, let's look where else we are. E-textbooks, we're almost there at the trough. I think we now may be actually moving up the slope again. Open source learning repositories is at the bottom. I, I actually vehemently disagree with this assessment. I happen to think that, that LORs are really wonderful things, especially text lore. <laughs> E-portfolios that are now, we're learning more how to use them. You know, there was a time where everyone thought it was the greatest thing since sliced bread. More people haven't, but we're still not all there yet. And then firmly in the plateau of productivity, self-publishing. So I think we can be critical once we get in the city to help shape the conversation about this sort of stuff. 
The other thing I think that we can do once we enter the city is to recapture the conversation and redefine it. Freire, liberating education consists in acts of cognition, not transferals of information. And one of my favorite researchers and writers about all of this is Kathy Davidson, who's at Haystack. Um, she wrote this in a Chronicle of Higher Ed review a few weeks, a few months ago. People live to contribute what they know and are willing to learn from one another, not just from experts. That's the paradigm shift that as educators committed to the future well-being of our students, we need fearlessly to embrace. We have a potential for a learning mashup of the loftiest, most creative, learner-centered kind. I'm excited because uh, Kathy is going to um, put her money where her mouth is and um, teach a MOOC in January of 2014 called The Future of Higher Education. And Duke is a Coursera campus, so she's using Coursera. And she has been very clear that she doesn't think that Coursera's platform, or really most of the other platforms, allow for a lot of interaction. And so one of her goals with this class is that they're going to try to turn that on its edge. Linguists um, sometimes call it using the master's tool to dismantle the master's house. Uh, I think I may have uh, read a, a French philosopher there, Michel Foucault, that used to talk about that. Um, we can reframe the conversation, but we have to be brave enough to do that. We have to be willing to take the slings and the arrows from faculty and from administrators. And we have to be willing to ask hard questions that are going to make people uncomfortable and then admit that they're going to make people uncomfortable. And be committed to dealing with their discomfort and seeing if we can't move beyond it and dealing with our own fear and discomfort. So I think we're about to get into the gate. I think we're about halfway in. And we haven't necessarily been discovered completely yet. But if we want to shape what's going to happen, we've got to be willing to embrace our role. And I'm sorry I'm going to use this term, so don't throw anything at me. We have to embrace our role as change agents. I know, change agents. You know, it's part of the buzzword bingo now. But I really do think this is, this is the optimistic part of me, which is unusual for historians. I'm, we're usually pretty pessimistic. I do think that we have a moment of change. We have a crisis that we haven't had before. And you're the people that can drive that change. You can do it on your campuses. You can do it across systems. But you're in the belly of the beast for good or for bad. And in 10 or 15 years, I don't know what's going to matter. I suspect, though, that what you do will have as much or more impact. What you do in the next two years will have as much or more impact on what the next 10 or 15 years looks like than what we've ever had before. And let's face it, you're the ones that are in the horse. You're the ones that are in the trenches. Folks will listen to you. They're not going to listen to me. I'm a bureaucrat. I'm a talking head. But you have the relationships. And you have the ability to shape this and change it. And I think when you do, when you continue to do it, because you're really already doing it, you're going to impact more students than what any of us can imagine. So those are a lot of questions. No magic silver bullets. Maybe you agreed with some of it, maybe you didn't. I'd love to hear what you didn't agree with it. Um, but let's, let's do it. Let's forget about what the magic lists are. Um, all these things are going to transform higher ed. Forget about the predictions. 
and just use our opportunities to sneak in and wreak havoc. Thanks.